Thank you, Mike. Uh, morning, everyone. So this talk's going to be a little more technical than the previous one. Um, fortunately, that's a hard act to follow, but I'll see what I can do. So I'll start with a bit of background. Uh, what is the SKA? Why am I here? And I'm going to be talking about Mesos, so I'll give a bit of introduction to that. And then I'll talk about what we built on top of Mesos and finish with some conclusions. So background. Uh, I should first mention I'm a, not an astronomer. I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, my background's in GPU development, so I'm not really a DevOps sort of person. I don't really know anything about Mesos, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway. <laughs> so what I work on is Meerkat, which is a radio telescope we're building out in the middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere is good for radio astronomy because you don't want interference from radio signals. So uh, this is sort of under construction, both the hardware and the software. It's a closer up view of one of these dishes. Uh, that's 13 and a half meters diameter. So that's actually a fairly sizable structure. And yesterday, I forget who was talking, but one of the speakers, you heard their cell phone received something and you could hear interference in the uh, AV system. Uh, if you put a cell phone close to one of those things and that happens, you'll blow the amplifier. It is very, very sensitive. So we're using this to look back to close to the beginning of the universe. Uh, but that, that's just the start. So after we've done uh, Meerkat, the next big thing is the square kilometer array. So Meerkat is a purely South African uh, thing that's being built. Square kilometer array is a big international effort, sort of, um, billions of billions of euros uh, going into it, that's an artist's impression of what this might look like standing out in the Karoo in South Africa. And there's also another component that's going to be built in Australia. I'm actually not involved in the square kilometre array at all, despite the fact that it says square kilometre array on my badge. I'm working on Meerkat. Um, I can answer more questions about that. Square kilometre array is still very much in the uh, stack of paper of design documents phase, which I'm not involved in. Um, as I say, I'm not an astronomer. Everything I know about astronomy comes from the Monty Python Ast Ast Galaxy song. <laughs> and I'm informed by my colleagues that some of those numbers are actually pretty far off these days. So don't ask me about astronomy. Okay, so uh, what does Meerkat actually look like? Uh, we've got um, three or actually it will be 64 dishes, which we have digitizers on. That digitizes some data. It comes into what we call a correlator beamformer, which does the very first level of data processing. Uh, that's a separate team. I work in the science data processor team. So we do sort of further data processing to try and actually make, turn it into useful scientific data that uh, astronomers can then actually work with. And that all goes into an archive. Archive is also part of the SDP team, but it's not something I work with. It's not something I'll be talking about today. So everything I talk about today is going to be this SDP, Science Data Processor, component. And just to complete the picture, there's a control and monitoring system that drives all these things. Uh, so that tells the telescopes where to point, uh, switches things on and off, collects all the sensors, has alarms that provide the user interface for the operators to the telescope. Again, I'm not going to be talking about that. So you might be wondering, what on earth am I doing at ScaleConf? Uh, you know, all the other talks, 100 million users here, 100 million websites there, billion tables here. We don't have 100 million users. There aren't that many astronomers that are keen for this data. <laughs> what we do have, however, is a lot of data. So each of these dishes is digitizing 34 gigabits a second of data. You multiply that by 64 dishes, you're talking about about two terabits a second flowing off these dishes. So I did a rough calculation. That's somewhere around four billion photos a day, depending how big your photos are, just to put it into sort of terms that uh, you might be used to from uh, web type things. Uh, but, but that's all flowing. <laughs> yeah. That's all flowing in through one switch. So it's, it's very localized, very high density uh, data that we're dealing with. Uh, so for the correlated beamformer, we hire a lot of smart hardware engineers. They build FPGA images, which do it's fairly simple processing, but it's very high speed and low, uh, very efficient processing on this data to reduce it. Um, it's actually probably going to be a lot less than 600 gigabits. That's a sort of theoretical peak of if they switch on all the features at once. 
but you're still talking about quite a lot of data coming into the signed state processor. So we do things with GPUs to speed that up, but we still need to, we're still gonna need to do a bit of horizontal scaling. And by the time we actually archive the data, it's cut down to a mere sort of 20 gigabits a second or so, somewhere around there. We haven't finished building this yet, so these numbers are probably gonna change. So we have just ordered, I think it's something like two and a half tons of hard drives. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> uh, that's gonna build this archive, but even then you see that's after we've reduced the data by quite a lot. And you can reduce the data because most of what you get is noise. It's very noisy data, and once you've extracted all the meaning out of it, you've actually got a lot less, but still quite a lot. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through this diagram. This is just to show that we have got the science data process isn't just doing one thing, it's got lots of little bits and pieces. Uh, data sort of flows in from the left somewhere. We do various bits of processing, we've got a switch that connects it all, and you've got various archive bits down here where it ends up. So the point is just, this is sort of a microservices type thing. We've got all these different pieces that connect to each other and communicate. But it's a bit different from uh, some of these other microservices you might have seen. So we've got almost no HTTP going on, we've, other than sort of the user front end to look at the uh, drive the telescope and look at displays. Uh, we're using something called CATCP, which is the crew array telescope control protocol, so it's sort of a simple RPC type thing. Uh, we've been building this thing, well, iterating over different telescopes for I think over 10 years now, so kind of predates the trend of everything must be HTTP. Uh, the data plane is kind of interesting as well. That's actually not even TCP anymore. This is UDP, and we use a lot of multicast. And if you used TCP, you might be wondering why on earth would anyone use UDP? Well, this is a real-time system. We can't say, hang on, stop the world. Uh, we need to retransmit some packets. The world's gonna keep spinning and the data's gonna keep coming out of the sky, so we have to use real-time protocols here. So a lot of your sort of load balances and other typical things you might be used to working with aren't designed for this sort of system. And the other thing is the entire system is somewhat stateful. So normally you'd expect that you'd start up your databases and your web servers and so on and you just leave them running and they're gonna run forever and you might need to restart them to update things but its state is always running. We build what we call subarrays where we take some of the dishes Possibly all of them in most cases, but sometimes you might want to leave some out to do maintenance on them, or whatever. It's a collection of dishes and then a bunch of other compute resources, so as many FPGAs as you need for whatever type of science you're doing, and as many other compute resources you need. And you bundle them all together, and that's called a subarray. And that has a life cycle. So it starts off you know, not really existing, and then you say, I want to collect these things and run things in this mode. You put it all together and you configure it and it's idle and you say, right, I'm ready to look at the sky now, point the things here, we can start capturing data. You can capture some data and then when your uh, time slice is up or the thing you're looking at sets below the horizon or whatever it is, and you can stop observing and then eventually you say, well, okay, I'm done with this particular configuration, let's tear it all down, uh, build something different because we're gonna look at the sky in a different way. So that means you've got this, these very stateful systems that is a bit unusual from uh, what you might be used to. Okay, so everyone has to have their horror stories. This is the sort of ugly dog, if you remember from yesterday. Uh, this is where we were about two years ago uh, when I was joining. <laughs> okay, so it used to be to deploy things, you SSH into the production server on the shared account. That should already be, yeah. You should be getting worried already, right? Okay? You, you go to the Git repository that's on, it's checked out, and you pull whatever the latest changes are from master, whatever happens to have landed there. Uh, you do a pseudo pip install. Uh, if you were at PyCon, you'll know that I did a lightning talk that says don't do that, but we do it anyway. Um, and you sort of bounce the service that's running. And then the real horror starts, is you go, oh, that didn't work. Well, let me, let me fix it. <laughs> okay, it's fixed now. And you notice it doesn't say commit those changes. So then next time, you go back to step two, 
and next time you do it, you've now got, uh, you go, oh, there's local changes. Or sometimes people remember to commit but not push. So then you've got, oh, I've got these local commits that just sit on this production server. <laughs> yeah. We're not doing that in STP anymore. Uh, this still happens in our organization, though. It's, it's quite terrifying, but we've moved on. We're now trying to use all the latest flavors of the month. So we've actually been using Docker for a bit over two years now. Uh, we use Ansible and FAI to uh, provision our hardware. Uh, Jenkins for CI, Prometheus and Grafana for metrics. We're not really using that that heavily yet. And the Elastic Stack just for logging. And one thing I'll mention is it turns out that just because you've now put a tool in place doesn't mean everyone's now on board with using it. You actually have to develop the culture of, yes, no, you can't log into the server and start poking things anymore. You have to do it through Ansible. Okay, so this is sort of the next evolution of our scaling, uh, pre-Mesos still, but trying to make things a bit more sane. So we run something called uh, our master controller, which coordinates all our services, manages all these subarrays. And then on each of, each of these blue bars is a physical box. Uh, we have a bunch of actual physical hardware sitting out in the crew because you can't really uh, get all this data two terabytes a second or whatever into the cloud. It's just not practical. So you can call this edge compute if you like. We're moving the compute to where the data is. <laughs> okay. So when we want to set up one of these subarrays, the controller monitoring system tells us to go and configure. And the old solution was then our con master controller would talk to the Docker daemons on each of these hosts uh, using TLS. And it would ask them to start up the various bits of services we needed. And they'd start up. Doesn't really matter too much what they are. But this is a bit limited because all the configuration of scheduling was static. So ingest, um, let's get a laser pointer. So ingest over here was hard coded to always run on this machine. If that machine had fallen over, well, tough. You're not gonna, you don't get to run until it's started up again. And also, there was no sort of management of are we oversubscribing things. So if you start up another subarray which also needs an ingest, that's also going to run on the same box. And if you start too many subarrays, it's just going to overload the box and it's going to catch fire. So, you know, this, this has actually been working for us fairly well, but we need something that's going to scale now that we're building a lot more antennas and we need multiple of each of these services to handle the load. So that brings us on to Mesos. Um, just curious, how many people actually use Mesos? Okay, almost no one, I was surprised. Okay. Um, so just to give you a vague idea of what the heck is this Mesos thing. Uh, this is a slide from the official documentation. So it's a coordination system for managing containers. So you've got your actual bits of hardware down here, which run, each runs a Mesos agent, which takes care of launching containers on those agents. You've got a master here, possibly in a quorum, uh, to give you high availability. It uses Zookeeper just for master election. And then you can put schedulers on top of that. So. I've got examples here of using Hadoop and MPI, but we're actually plugging in our own scheduler on top of these other schedulers. So what does Mesos actually do, though? So mostly what it deals with is sort of bookkeeping for resources. So you'll have an agent at the bottom, and it offers some resources. So it's got four CPUs, and it's got four gigabytes of RAM. That's available resources. This is, again, from the Mesos official documentation. It tells the master, OK, I've got these things to offer. The master decides that, OK, framework one gets to have a shot at these resources. So it'll tell agent one about this. Agent one says, oh, that's, that's very convenient. I've got some tasks to run. I'm going to run task one, and that needs two CPUs and one gig of RAM. And task two needs one CPU and two gig of RAM. And I'm going to run it using that uh, agent that you've told me about. And we'll ask the master to make it so, and the master will forward that information down to the agent, and the agent will start these things up. Um, so there's a bunch of things it doesn't do. So you may also have heard of Marathon. You might be wondering, what, well, what's the difference between Marathon and Mesos? So Marathon is the sort of de facto standard scheduler that people put on top of Mesos. 
And you can kind of compare Mesos plus Marathon as sort of equivalent to Kubernetes. So Mesos, as I say, does mostly bookkeeping. It keeps track of all the agents in your system and what resources they have, how much resources have been allocated, uh, where your tasks are running. And it also does a bit of resource isolation. So if you say you're only going to use three gigs of RAM, it will prevent you using more than three gigs of RAM. Uh, Marathon does all the sort of clever stuff on top, uh, which you actually want to just say, define an application, make it so. So if it has uh, too many tasks run, Marathon decides what's going to run. Um, it decides which machine things are going to run on. And it'll, if you say, I want five instances of my web server, it'll make sure you always have five. And if one of them falls over, it'll start up another one. And yeah, covers failover as well. So that's Mesos and Marathon. So now I'm going to talk about the framework that we built on top of Mesos to replace that diagram I had earlier of the master controller directly talking to these Docker demons. OK, so we're a Python shop. So we're using a library called PyMesos to talk to Mesos. So Mesos master sits over here on some box. And as of 1.0, which is actually fairly recent, it now has an HTTP API. It used to have some sort of, uh, not quite proprietary, but difficult, not really open thing based on protocol buffers, but it's now uh, HTTP JSON sort of API. And, and PyMesos provides a handy wrapper over that HTTP API called a scheduler driver. And then over on the left is our scheduler, which is the piece we write. So we can call this driver to ask it to do various things. And it's actually a pretty simple API. That's not every single call, but that's the majority of the calls you can actually make into this driver. So you can tell it to start and stop tasks. You can tell it, give me offers. I've got stuff to run. Uh, stop giving me offers. That's the suppress offers, because I don't have anything to run. Uh, it's got some reconciliation for if things fall over. And you have to acknowledge status updates. And so you make this calls into this library. It handles all the details of HTTP and you know, redirects and what if the connection falls over and all the rest. And obviously, it's two-way traffic. So various events will happen in the system. And you'll get callbacks about this. Again, there's a few more calls to do with um, sort of re-registration if the master falls over. But in terms of the stuff you're actually going to use every day, that's, this is basically it. You get offers some resources. Master can decide, actually, you don't deserve those anymore if you've hung on to them for too long or if somebody else needs them more. And you get status updates about tasks in the system. So your task has started running or your task has died. And as I say, there's a few other status updates you can get. You can find out if an agent got fell over or that sort of thing. So that's easy. Right, that's Monty Python reference if you don't spot it. Uh, it's a little trickier than that. I've said there's very few API calls. All the complexity is actually hidden in the arguments to these API calls. So I'm not going to go through all that. That's actually a very cut down version of an offer. I've skipped bits out of it. The point is you get these sort of big JSON structures, and most of the work is in figuring out, OK, what stuff do I need to populate in these JSON structures? People are actually quite hard to use API. OK, so this is a slightly simplified version of what our workflow looks like now. When we want to create a subarray, uh, we get told we're going to configure a subarray. We need to bring some things up. So this revive offers call it basically says to the master, actually, please start sending me offers. I've got work to do. Uh, the master will then send us resource offers, which we collect until we reckon we've got enough to actually start up all the things we need to start up. Uh, at that point, we can call suppress offers, just so we're not continuously being bombarded with offers well, we know we're not going to use. And then we create these task info structs. So task info is the kind of top level structure that tells Mesos everything it needs to know about how to run a task. So what Docker image is it going to run? What command line options? What environment variables? Which machines are going to run on? What resources does it need? Pretty much everything. So we build these structures, and we pass it into this launch tasks function, which tells, the master con sorry, tells Mesos to actually go and make it so. And after that, we wait for these status updates to tell us that the tasks have started running. Uh, hopefully, they are actually running, and we don't get something back saying, actually, it fell over and died because we couldn't find the image or whatever it was. 
And once everything's running, then we're ready. Now, as I say, obviously, this is a bit simplified because we have to deal with failures. It's all happening asynchronously. It's the async I.O., so uh, there are other possible paths, but that's the basic idea. Okay, so why haven't I mentioned Marathon? Why are we reinventing this wheel? So we did look at using Marathon, and we decided not to use it. And it turned out that was probably the right decision, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> so we thought, oh, we don't need all this high-level stuff. How hard can this all be? It's, we can just program on, on Mesos. And because we already had a sh essentially a very simple sh static scheduler, which I showed earlier, which uh, handles launching a bunch of tasks. We thought, well, we'll just sort of plug Mesos in on the bottom of that, and we've got our own scheduler. We don't need Marathon to do this. Actually, um, Marathon does give you quite a lot of convenience, and but it turns, but it's also a bit limited in some of the things. And I'm going to go through those now and show what limitations uh, Mesos has that we've had to work around that I don't think we would have been able to do if we'd been uh, going through the high level of Marathon. So what's going on here? Uh, so speed two is our, well, speed is the streaming protocol for exchange of astronomical data, which is our, essentially our data plane UDP uh, multicast protocol. And this is a benchmark I wrote which doesn't actually take stuff over the network. It just constructs a bunch of packets in memory and then consumes them as fast as it possibly can. And as you can see, we do high performance networking, so we get 55 gigabits a second, which is good, because our network cards, we've got a lot of 40 gig network cards, so if we can go at 55, we're doing okay, but that's excluding all the overhead of actually getting the data out of the network card and into the CPU. But then we stick some magic runes on the front of it, and suddenly it goes 30% faster. So what's going on here? Um, so the problem is Mesos has a very simple view of a system, it says, oh, it's just a bucket of some CPU and a bucket of some memory and some disk. And that's a nice simple view, but actually real hardware looks a bit more like that. And again, this is something I've actually simplified. It's a diagram that comes out of a tool called HWLock uh, for hardware locations. And this is a dual CPU system. So you've got a CPU socket there with four cores. You've got another CPU socket there with four cores. And you can see the entire diagram's got a split down the middle here. And that's typically what actually happens in a dual CPU, dual socket system is all the hardware is actually attached to one CPU or the other. You can see even the memory, you might not be able to read it, but you've got a, it's a two to six gig system, you've got 128 gig attached to that CPU, you've got 128 gig attached to that CPU, some high performance networking cards, um, there's a GPU there, some hard drives and so on. And there's a bus connecting these two, it's called QPI if you're on an Intel system. And it's fairly fast, but it's got some latency. And it can actually really hammer performance if you're moving all your memory traffic across this bus. And that's what we saw in the previous slide, is if you don't take care to force all the threads in that benchmark to run on the same CPU socket, then you end up accessing memory across this bus. And that was uh, really killing performance there. And some of the stuff we do really does matter with this. We have to. We're very close to the edge on some of these data capture things. And it's partially because not only do we have these very high speed um, total bandwidth, but some of the individual streams are actually extremely high bandwidth. So each digitizer stream is 17 gigabits a second in a single data stream. So we kind of have to capture that all in one place. We can't easily distribute that. So uh, how do we solve this problem on Mesos? Well, one of the really nice things about Mesos is you can define your own resources, you know, given whatever names you like. You're not limited to just CPU, GPU, disk memory, whatever it has built into it. So we define our own resource called cores, which corresponds to the CPU cores, and it's a range resource, which means it has discrete elements in a sequence. So we have eight of these resources. They are zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, we still need to know about that topology or which cores are on which side of the CPU bus. So we use something called an attribute, which is just some metadata that you can associate with any of your agent machines. And this metadata is then available to your scheduler when it's deciding how to run things. So this tells us that um, so CAT has to be controller is the name of our master controller. 
and this tells us the NUMA topology is call 0246 on one CPU socket and 1357 on the other CPU socket. Uh, NUMA, by the way, stands for non-uniform memory architecture because it means that not every core has equal access to every piece of memory. And then in our sort of high performance tasks, uh, when we define the task, we say how many cores it needs. So this task needs two CPU cores. And then when our scheduler assigns resources, it doesn't just pick any two CPU cores, it looks at that topology information and makes sure that it assigns the two cores that come from the same CPU socket. And fortunately, Docker's got some uh, nice support for this, so you can tell it on the command line, uh, limit this task I'm about to launch to these two CPU cores. And that way we can guarantee that this thing's only running on one side of that QPI bus. Uh, it's not quite perfect. So one of the things is we're now actually talking about assigning cores when actually all we wanted to do was control which side of which socket we were running on. But actually these very performance sensitive tasks, we tend to use uh, CPU core pinning. So we'll actually take particular threads and say this thread will only ever run on this particular core. And that's because of cache affinity and um, cache invalidations. Because if a process moves between cores, it leaves its L1 cache behind. And that can uh, impact performance. It's not so much throughput that Im impacts, but it gives you some latency. And when you're trying to consume, say, 17 gigabits a second, and you suddenly take a millisecond out, that's several megabytes of data that's just got whizzed by when you weren't looking. Um, also, we haven't explicitly actually modeled the memory, which was sort of the point of this thing. So what happens is uh, when you allocate memory, it tr the kernel will try and allocate it on the same NUMA node that your process is running. So most of this works, but there can be some nasty cases where if one of those NUMA nodes completely runs out of memory, you might start allocating memory from the other one rather than crashing. So. That's still something we want to have a look at eventually. And we've also said, right, we're going to pin threads to individual CPU cores. This thread will only run on core one. And as long as everything is pinned, that's fine. But we also have these sort of lower priority tasks that are, you know, don't have these real-time requirements. And we don't pin those because we want them to just migrate to wherever there's free resources. But there's nothing actually physically preventing the kernel from running it on the same core that you've actually wanted to delegate to your one task. OK, so that's all about NUMA. Let's talk about GPUs, because we use GPUs for some of our highest performance data processing. And as of, I think, 1.0, Mesos added some support for GPUs, but it's quite limited. So you basically, when you define your task, you can say, I'd like two GPUs, please. What you can't say is, I'd like a quarter of a GPU. You have to specify a whole number of GPUs. Those are your GPUs. No one else will use them. Because we're doing this sort of streaming processing, we're not trying to do something as fast as possible. We just have to do it fast enough to keep up with the data that's coming in. So often that might mean if it's a lower bandwidth data stream, we might not need a whole GPU for that. We can share it. And similarly, we then want to share some memory. Uh, you also get no choice about which GPU you get. You just get a GPU, please. Um, sometimes that matters, uh, depending how heterogeneous your cluster is, obviously. And there's also, again, no NUMA awareness. So the GPU will be attached to one of these NUMA nodes. And in some cases, if you're moving a lot of data between the GPU and the, the rest of the system, then it matters whether it's on the same NUMA node or not. So. How have we solved this? Well, we kind of threw away the built-in GPU support and did our own. And it's a similar sort of idea to the cores. So we've made up some of our own resources. In this case, we've just got one GPU. So, and we haven't really tried to um, put a number on how much compute. We just say, just okay, GPU compute is 10 minutes. Uh, sorry, it's one, we have one unit of compute on this GPU, and it's got that many megabytes of memory. And then we use these attributes again to query the GPU for a bunch of information. And again, we, uh, so you've 
GPU or NVIDIA GPUs, you've got entries in slash dev slash NVIDIA whatever, and you have to make those available inside the container so that the GPU can be accessed, so we pass that through. Uh, the limitation here is these resource limits are not enforced. So you might ask for two gigs of GPU memory and actually use four, and things will just crash. So the solution is don't do that. But yeah, you don't necessarily know that you're doing it until after something's gone horribly wrong. Um, so networking, we also, obviously, with that kind of network traffic, we do a lot of fancy stuff. So we use something called InfiniBand Verbs API, which is a kernel bypass thing, so you can get packets from the network card directly into user space without the kernel seeing them, uh, which is important for performance. Um, but and the Mesos also doesn't give any kind of uh, management of bandwidth. Or there's a little bit of outbound bandwidth that can shape it, but it has no control over inbound bandwidth. And when you've got individual streams that are 13 gigabits a second, you can very quickly uh, be subscribing to more multicast than, than you know what to do with. And NUMA comes up again. And also, we have different physical networks which things are connected to. So you need to make sure that whichever machine you're running something on is actually connected to the right network. I'm going to... Oh, and we then also need to tell the task that's running, well, which of these multiple NICs in your machine do you need? I'm going to whiz through this a bit because I'm running short on time. It's very much the same as the GPU. We create custom resources for the bandwidth allocation, and we interrogate the NIC to set a bunch of attributes. And again, we can't enforce any of this, but um, at least means that as long as we get the task descriptions right, it'll all work. Okay. What about failure recovery? Well, actually, we haven't done this yet. Uh, we don't really need it yet. Apparently, for a radio telescope, if you have 80% of your time you're doing good, usable science, then you're doing well, because uh, you know, 40-ton dishes tend to actually break down a lot more than your servers. Uh, so, but if we're going to do this, um, it's not going to be too hard to do when we get to the point where we've got so many servers running that we really need to worry about them falling over. Uh, the main thing is because it's a stateful system, we need to start up a replacement task and bring it into the right state. Um, we also need a bit more service discovery so that anything that was talking to the old task can transparently discover where its replacement is now actually running. But the cool thing about multicast is that service discovery that's provided by your switch vendor. And the other thing is we run a Redis database to keep a uh, bunch of sensors and things while the system is running and a bit of config information. So if that falls over at the moment, we're already toast. Uh, we need that to be replicated. Okay, uh, what if our master controller falls over? That turns out to be quite a bit harder to do. So Mesos has got quite a good bit of documentation on advice on writing high ability frameworks, but it's just documentation. You still have to do all the work yourself. And again, that's where something like Marathon would have been better because they've done all that hard work. Okay, so what have we learned from all this? Well, not actually that much in production because it only rolled out to the site a week ago. But just to give you some idea of how much work this has been, uh, Mesos did most of the work for us. Uh, so the scheduler bit is our sort of generic scheduler that handles all this NUMA and GPU and so on. And actually, it turned out to be most of the code that, that makes up this master controller. So, but it's still not a huge amount of code in total. Uh, what's nice, uh, PyMesos is pretty good. You don't have to deal with all the nastiness of actually speaking HTTP. Um, Mesos is pretty good cleaning up when your framework crashes, which when you're developing is quite nice. You make a bug, your framework crashes. It used to be we had to then run around all the machines killing off all these Docker containers we'd started. Now Mesos takes care of that. Uh, it has a UI, which is kind of nice to see what's going on. And one of the cool things compared to using something like Marathon is uh, each of our tasks we run, we describe using Python code, which says how to figure out how to run it. And that makes it very expensive. So if we want to, say, um, limit things to run on a particular type of GPU, we just add some code into the launch for that. We don't have to create a new language for it. And we found the developers are fairly friendly and responsive when I've had issues. So it definitely seems to be a vibrant community. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. Bad is we had to reinvent the wheel for some simple stuff. So uh, just getting a list of resources 
you sometimes get these range resources which will say you've got this contiguous range port numbers plus that range plus that range. And you want to iterate over it in Python. We had to build that ourselves. Similarly, you might get two different offers from the same agent because uh, over time, and you want to aggregate those, you have to do that ourselves. And that's where a lot of that uh, 1,300 lines of code goes into. It's just simple stuff. Um, I'm going to skip that point because I'm running short on time. Uh, I kind of lied a bit about some of the attribute values. Uh, the grammar is very restrictive. You can only put those things in it. So we had to encode in base64, which is not a major train smash. It just means when you look at the raw values, it's not very descriptive. Um, turns out making a system fault tolerant when you're building on top of Mesos is still hard. Mesos gives you some tools, but you actually still have to do a lot of work, which is, again, where Marathon is, uh, takes care of work for you. Um, one last thing we found is if you want to add some new metadata to one of the agents, you can't just add it and restart the agent. It complains at you because it now doesn't match its checkpointed state, and you've got to actually do some cleanup, and it kills off all the containers you're running on that agent. And the GUI is nice for seeing like how much CPUs you've allocated, but it has no support at all for these custom resources we've added. Say, you know, we've got. Um, this much bandwidth. We can't really have no visibility of that in the user interface they provide. And also, I've managed to find a way to crash the Mesos agents and a way to crash the Mesos master in a few months of work. It's not quite as rock solid as we thought. On the other hand, when the master crashed, we didn't e actually notice the first time. We said, oh, something a bit odds happened, but it got right back up and it carried on running. Okay, um, so what do we still want to work on to actually make this a really properly scalable system? At the moment, we've sort of got ready for scaling, but we haven't actually scaled. Well, obviously, we need to do some high availability if we want to really make it scale. Uh, we haven't modeled the memory quite right. I've got some ideas on that. As mentioned, we want to isolate CPU cores 100% so that nothing else runs there. And we need to add some service discovery stuff just for uh, supporting failovers. And also, it's when everything's in a container, it's a little tricky to do debugging because you go, ooh, I want to try this. Let me try this. Add a line of code, commit it, push it to GitHub, wait for Jenkins to pull it, build your container, push it to your registry, pull it back down to your containers. Now you can test your one line of code. So we need something, a bit, some shortcuts for working in a dev box, which I've got some ideas. I've implemented some things, but it's not there yet. OK, and that's the end of my talk. Um, we are looking for people, so uh, you can always come chat to me during lunch if you're interested. And I think it's time for questions. You can use that. Okay, any questions? Brad? Um, how much of this stuff is open sourced? Ah, yes. So. In theory, we'd like to make all our stuff open source, but um, we're a government department, which means we're part of the NRF, which means anything we release has to go through a lot of bureaucracy before we can actually release it. So we have managed to release a few things. Uh, this stuff in particular is not released yet, unfortunately. Hi. Um, do you have any form of data du duplication, and what kind of technology do you use to do that if you are doing data du duplication? Mm, well, we're not doing any deduplication ourselves. I mean, the only deduplication is that Docker uh, itself, if you build a bunch of images off a common base layer, it will share the, date, the sort of file system that's in that base layer. But no, we're not deduplicating anything ourselves. Did you mean the actual data that's coming off the satellites? So the, the data that's coming off rather than the... Oh, right. Um, so, well, yes and no. So basically the data is mostly is sort of something you're looking at plus a bunch of Gaussian noise, or more or less Gaussian noise. So what happens when you add a bunch of that up together is an average it is the noise goes down as the square root of the amount of stuff you're accumulating. And that's mostly where those uh, decreases from sort of two terabits down to sort of 20 gigabits is 
we take a bunch of data in time and in frequency and average it together, and then there's a lot less data, but the noise has gone down. Um, sorry. Is IPv6 the thing you care about? Yeah, we're not using IPv6 at the moment. Um, I th you know, the correlated beamformer guys are the ones that really look at sort of our networking, our big switch, which takes uh, two terabits of traffic. Uh, apparently, one of the limitations is if you go IV IPv6, then you can only fit in half as many or maybe a quarter as many multicast groups into the routing tables. So we've actually deliberately gone with IPv4 for our internal networking just so we can actually get more into our routing tables. And in fact, also this InfiniBand verbs stuff on the particular network cards we've got. Uh, you can do hardware f uh, flow routing, so you can subscribe directly to a particular uh, IP address in the hardware of the NIC, and that also only supports IPv4. I want to ask with regards to the marathon and all the NUMA architecture stuff which is not taken into account by Mises that you had to develop yourself. If you had to look back um, and make the choice again, would it be less work to have used marathon and try retrofit marathon possibly for all the NUMA stuff or is that almost impossible with the no GUI support yeah. and stuff? As I say, we haven't looked a huge amount of marathon. We sort of looked at it to see what it is, but we don't, I've not looked into the internals, I've not looked into uh, we've not used it in anger, really, so I'm not too sure. Hi there. Um, I guess my, my question really comes down to two words, is, is what's noise? Um, the experience I've had in various scientific programs and looking historically, things that are noise today are information tomorrow. So what's the risk of you, you kind of now cleaning out that noise, drag, taking that bandwidth down to... 20 gigabits and then tomorrow some scientists come and go, oh, but <laughs> we wanted that data. Yeah, so some of this is a how long is a piece of string and essentially the more you average down the, you get things called time smearing because the earth is actually rotating while you're doing this and, but, you know, we do actually work out, you know, how much can we time smear safely without introducing too much more error. Uh, noise comes from a few things, so there's thermal noise from the actual system, so uh, the receivers are actually cooled down to something like 18 Kelvin just to reduce thermal noise, and we still get thermal noise. And the signals themselves are actually uh, sort of random signals, so you can actually uh, characterize in terms of uh, probability distributions exactly what that noise looks like. So we've got a fairly good idea of what it is. Just for, um, with regards to your uh, stream, your data coming in, obviously a lot of data over here. Um, <clears throat> what type of storage and retention policies do you have in place with the large amount of data you uh, are streaming constantly? Right, so that's still under construction. As I say, we've ordered um, two and a half tons of hard drives, uh, which is going to store certain types of data. Um, at some point, we're going to also be doing storing a lot of stuff to tape uh, not for permanent storage, but uh, for some amount of time, and then if the scientists particularly want that raw data, uh, then you know we can send them the tape. Uh, last. Okay, cool. Um, with all this data, have you found evidence of alien life? Well, as the Monty Python song says, we better pray that there's intelligent life out there because it's bugger all down here. 